So in this session, what we're going to be looking at is your catamaran sailing problems and what we can do about them. Um, as advertised, we're going to be taking a bit of a, excuse the pun, but a deep dive into how to prevent the pitch pole in this uh, Q&A session to start off. So I think we should dive straight in or nosedive straight in and look at, firstly, uh, for those of you who don't know, what is the pitch pole? All right. So the pitch pole is where the front of the boat gets overloaded, goes under the water and the back of the boat kind of overtakes. If I was to illustrate this, all new technology today. So if this is our boat, the hull like this, here's the sail. It is where there is too much load pushing the bow down, which results in the bow going under the water like this, if this is the water, and the boat ends up in a capsized position. So um, why does the bow of the boat become overloaded? Well, there's two main reasons why the bow of the boat would become overloaded. One of them is that the people on the boat are too far forwards for the situation. Or the other one is that there's too much load in the rig coming from behind, which is pushing the bow of the boat down. OK, so um, where do we go from that? Um, so that is what a pitch pole is when there's too much pressure on the bows of the boat, bows dig in, boat flips over and generally the people on the boat take a bit of a, a swing if they're on the trapeze and end up in the water. Now, firstly, if you're new to catamaran sailing, don't be too scared of the pitch pole um, because especially if you are on the trapeze, what happens is you just get flung for, uh, clear of the boat if you've pitch pulled from on the trapeze. So it's not too bad. And also it is quite hilarious um, when you're in front of the boat in a kind of what just happened kind of way. So um, yeah, don't be too scared of the pitch pole. But of course, if you try to do well in a racing situation, for example, any sort of capsize is going to slow you down. So how can we prevent the pitch pole? The first one, if we are just reaching in high winds, then what can we do? The first thing, and this is going to seem quite obvious. Um, hold on, just sorting out my crayons. Um, so the first thing we can do if we're sailing and we're, if it's windy and we're sailing on a course which is more downwind, so if this is our wind here and if we're sailing on a course which is across the wind or downwind, one of these two situations, these are going to be when we are most prone to sticking the nose of the boat in. So um, the first thing that we can do to prevent putting the bows of the boat under the water is to move back on the boat. So if, um, if we're sat in, then we want to be as close as we can uh, to each other towards the back of the boat. Um, because any weight that we have further back is going to help to lever the bows up and prevent them from digging in. Um, if we've been out on the trapeze, then if we are out on the trapeze, then of course we want to get as far back as we possibly can. So 
if we're double trapezing, let's um, be all the way back here to really try to put lever against that leeward bow. This is the danger zone here. So that's the first and the most obvious way that we can avoid sticking the nose in by moving our weight back. Now, the second way that we can um, that we can help to prevent sticking the nose of the boat in is by playing the main sheet. Yes, I've said it before and I'm saying it again. The more that you play the main sheet on your boat, the more it means that you know where you are. Because what you'll find is if you're playing the main sheet a lot, when you pull the main sheet in, if you are in a situation where the pitch pole is possible, you'll feel if you pull the main sheet in slowly, the bows will start to, to go down. If you let the main sheet out slightly, the bows will come up again. So the more frequently you either let the main sheet out or pull it in, or ideally both, um, you will really know where the limit is more so. There we go. So play the main sheet more. Along with playing the main sheet more, if you are in a situation where the wind is very strong and you're having to sail with the traveller eased most of the time, um, sorry, the main sheet eased most of the time, then yes, as I might have just let slip, um, let the traveller out so then you can sail with a tighter main sheet. And that means if you're sailing with a tighter main sheet, you'll be in more control and you won't have to play as much of that sheet. Oh no. Yeah, so play the main sheet a lot, get, wet, get back on the boat. And if you're having to ease the main sheet all of the time, then let the traveler out more so that you can sail with the main sheet tighter. But still, even if you've just let the traveler out, it will be your main sheet, which is your, um, that is what is going to stop you from sticking the nose in um, overall. That is your get out of swimming club um, bit of rope that you have got on the boat. So there we go. Um, yeah, so this is if we're reaching on a half wind course or a beam reach across the wind. If we were sailing more on a downwind course, I don't know if I've got a picture for this, but what we want to do is, um, this is whether we're sailing with the spinnaker up or not, is, um, so if the wind is coming from here, so a downwind course, like a, what we would call a broad reach, whether we've got the spinnaker up or not, the way to keep the pressure off the bows of the boat on this point of sail is to sail the boat as fast as we can. Um, because the faster that we sail in a strong wind, the less pressure that we have that's trying to knock us over. If we imagine that the wind strength here is 20 and on our boat we're doing 15, I may have said this before, then that means that the actual pressure coming from behind us, which is actually forcing the bows of the boat down, is five. The science here may not be perfect, but it is actually how it works. So um, the faster that we go, the less pressure we're going to have trying to stick the bows of the boat under the water. So especially if we've got that big spinnaker up, we want to sail the boat as fast as possible. Now, you may think if you're sailing downwind, we've got our catamaran sailors um, angles that we use going downwind, which would generally be with the apparent wind, the wind that we're experiencing on the boat, if I just exaggerate these telltales a bit, going straight across the boat like this. Yes, this is the most efficient direction that we can sail downwind for the boat speed combined with the, um, how do you say, uh, boat speed and course. But 
If we sail more up towards the wind, yes, we are going to sail faster and um, it will actually take a bit of the load off the bows, but we're not going to get where we want to go, which is downwind. So on the downwind course, when a gust is coming, the way to avoid sticking the nose in is as soon as we feel that gust hit us, we want to turn the boat more downwind. So we're absorbing that gust and we can almost kind of free wheel with that gust onto a more downwind course. Our apparent wind will stay the same because we're going faster and that's going to help to take the load off. Now, like I might have mentioned in a recent video on how to sail downwind when it's too windy to sail downwind, um, as I might have mentioned there, then um, if it does get really too strong, then uh, sailing deeper than that 90 degree angle can make it a bit less precarious on the downwind course. OK, all right. So that is um, number two in the how not to pitch pole. Now, this is a tough one on the jibe. Yeah, on the jibe is sometimes when it's very difficult to avoid the, uh, the sticking in of the nose. So when you go for a jibe, the way to avoid um, getting a load of load, because of course, the time when you're going to get load on a jibe is just after the mainsail comes across. So you're going to go from there to there. And that second that the wind, oh, sorry, um, comes into the mainsail here when it first comes in that's when you're going to be going at your slowest because you're going to have had this time very deep downwind where the boat is going to be slowing down. And um, and then the sail will come across and uh, when it fills, loads of pressure. And that is when Johnny Pitchpole can come to town because all that pressure coming on with um, no boat speed that's like we were saying just now. Um, um, if you're not going very fast, all of the pressure is trying to knock the bows down. So the way we can get around this on the jibe is a number of things. First thing, timing of the jibe. Uh, the way you want to time the jibe to avoid sticking the nose in is if it's windy and gusty, you want to wait for a gust unless there happens to be a big lull in the wind where there's less wind and that gives you the opportunity just to sneak one through when it's not quite so windy but if it's if it's windy throughout then what you want to do is get the boat up to speed on your normal broad reach with those telltales 90 degrees apparent and then when you get a gust turn the boat downwind like you would do for a gust on a broad reach. And then when you feel that the boat has settled from turning downwind, uh, so you'll feel it settle um, when you get onto that new sweet course, that's a little bit like the boat is freewheeling and that is the time to go round the corner. Now, when you're turning through the jibe there, um, don't straighten up before the mainsail comes across, because if you do that, then the sail again will fill with pressure uh, because you'll be slowing down. And again, we'll be back to square one of the, when the sail comes across, there'll be too much pressure, bows go in. So the best time to straighten up is just after the mainsail comes across even tweak the boat back downwind a little bit to take the sting off it a bit. So you go through the jibe, main sail comes across, glides across gently if you've got it right, comes across and then straight away, straighten up, 
get settled on the new side and then get going again. Um, yeah, easier said than done, possibly. Um, but if you don't feel that your life is at risk by doing it, when it is windy, maybe it's worth throwing a jibe in, even though usually you might think, actually, we'll go for a tack. It's going to be a little bit less precarious. But if you never jibe when it's windy, um, that means you're not going to gain that windy jibing experience, which at some point you might need to put that jibe in. So if it's not too hairy, um, not too much wind, then do practice your heavier wind jibes when you get the opportunity. Now, one last thing with the, um, the pitch pole is the shape of the hull. The type of boat that you're sailing does make a difference. So if you're sailing a boat which has a deck on it, so when I say a deck, um, we're coming back to our Hobie 16, as you'd expect, which very much has a deck on it like this. Um, like this, whereas the other type of boat, type of hull, if we stay fairly traditional, then no deck and certainly narrower at the front. So if that's the front there. If with a boat like this, with a, a fat deck and very little volume in the bow, um, if you stick the deck of this boat under the water, it is very unlikely that you're going to be able to get it back out. Once that's gone under, you can almost guarantee that you are going to capsize. Whereas with a boat like this, which would be like um, examples, like a Dart 18, like a Tornado, like a Prindle 18-2, um, anything which has got a traditional shape, like a Formula 18, um, if you stick the deck under, as long as the people on the boat don't go flying forwards, then that means that you could save it and pop it back out. There we go. All right, so um, I think that is all that I am going to say on the topic of how to prevent the pitch pole. I hope that can help you to keep your hair dry next time it is windy but um the main thing is speed is your friend especially on the downwind course the faster that you go the um more in control you are actually going to be but do watch those telltales at the front of the boat to make sure that you're sailing at the correct apparent wind angle all right so into the live chat um, I just thought I'd start off with something this week, um, just because um, it has been slowing down a little bit in the live. So I thought I'd have something to start off with. So I'd like to say hello to everyone who's checking in. Hello to Mark and Janet in Ohio. Great to have you on board. Um, hello to Mason. Nice to have you with us. Whereabouts are you, Mason? Uh, it's always nice to know where people are in the live chat. By the way, if you happen to be watching this later, so not live, and you are, you've got a catamaran sailing question that you would like to have answered, then um, just put it in the comments below and I will respond to that question in next week's live Q&A session. There we go. Um, so um, we've got low or Lao. Um, sorry about the bad print. I'm going to go with um, Lau from Cape Town. All right, nice. Hope you're well. Enjoying the video from Cape Town. Great stuff. I've had so much good times, so many good times in Cape Town. I absolutely love it there. Um, so much wind. Good place to practice avoiding your pitch pole. That is for sure. Um, Mason says, I need some tips on fast upwind sailing. All right, if um, perhaps Mason, as well as letting us know where you're tuning in from, 
um, you could let us know um, what type of boat um, you're talking about and if there's any other specifics, because that is quite a broad uh, question, given the amount of wind that there might be, the type of boat you might be using and um, all sorts. OK, we've got Benny on board in Sweden. Aaron's with us in New Zealand, loving these new start times. All right. Yeah, glad it's working out for you. Uh, I'm sure that it helps most people. Um, all right. We've got Lee on board in Clearwater, Florida. Always flying the flag there. Nice to have you on board as always. RJ Fleet uh, on board in Lake Benton, Minnesota. And then heading over to Maui, Hawaii, we've got Ryan, um, who has just completed, um, I believe, the restoration of a Hobie 14. So we should be seeing some featured Hobie 14 from Maui on Show Us Your Cat fairly soon, I am hoping. Um, by the way, Show Us Your Cat, it did seem that last week's episode was rather popular. Um, I can't imagine why that was. Um, but um, if you want more Show Us Your Cat, then I need more cats to show. Yes, I have had a few come in, but I want to get a good fleet together before putting the next episode together to make it a really good episode. Um, so if you are thinking of um, sending me some video or some pictures of your boat, for an upcoming episode of Show Us Your Cat, then let's have it and um, I will show everybody your cat. Thank you very much. All right, Michael in Chicago uh, says we've put our Hobies away last weekend. Oh no. Yeah, I suppose it is um, into November now. So um, I dare say up in the north of um, America, it is going to be getting pretty chilly now. Um, hope you've had a good season anyway. All right, so Graham says, also she in before the jibe on the Hobie 16 and time the swells. This is a very good point, actually. Yeah, I did miss this. I, I thought I better um, not miss that and I missed it. But anyway, yeah, before you jibe, any type of boat without a spinnaker, when it's windy, what is really going to help you is if you if you've been sailing with your traveller out, then bring the traveller in first, not all the way to the middle, but certainly in as far as the toe strap, maybe a bit more, because what that does is it brings the mainsail more into the centre line of the boat, which means that when you're turning through the jibe, the sail is going to go across earlier. It's good that it goes across earlier because if it goes across earlier, you're going to still have more speed on, which is going to take the load out of the sail when it comes across and fills. So bring the traveller in first, then bang it through the jibe um, and then let the traveller out again. Um, and like um, Graham says, or if there's if you are sailing with swell, then same sort of thing. But um as what I was saying with the gust, so it feels like you're freewheeling. If you can time it so you can jibe when you're going down a wave, definitely not up a wave. If you're going up a wave, then your boat's going to be slowing down, loading up all that pressure. Whereas if you're going down a wave, again, you're going to be kind of freewheeling a bit, which is going to help to take you around that corner without that big slam of the mainsail as it goes across. Thank you for that, Graham. All right, we've got Hans on board in Germany, I'm sure. Um, Hans, who was a key member on the Wildwin Beach. Um, working on the red Jenica, it will be red and white afterwards. Yes, so um, if, unfortunately, Hans's last sail of the season here on the Tornado, um, the quite an old Jenica um, that I put on the boat, uh, did get ripped, but um, Hans has taken it back to Germany and he is putting it back together. Um, so it'll be good to see um, 
how that comes out, Hans. Good luck with that. All right, Mason is in Virginia. All right, nice one, Mason. Um, in Richmond. Very good. Uh, still need some more info, Mason, on what specifically, uh, a few more specifics about the upwind sailing. At least um, can we focus on a wind strength and um, a type of boat? All right, so Lau says, with regards to timing the jibe, what I try to do when sailing in the sea is to jibe on the downside of a swell. This will help you slightly to keep the speed up as you go through the jibe. There we go. Confirmed from somebody who sails in waves. I haven't sailed a catamaran in proper waves for quite a long time. So um, that's good to have that confirmed. All right, we've got Etan on board in Santa Cruz, California. Nice. Um, how's it on the West Coast right now? Is it still pretty nice weather for getting out there? Let us know. All right, so Lau says, glad you enjoyed Cape Town. The easiest way is low. Okay, thank you very much for that. All right, Etan says, I just started restoring a junked, I'm assuming that's a NACRA 5.2, will probably take me a few months, but I'm taking lots of pictures. Yeah, that is absolutely perfect. If you're restoring a boat, this is some of the best uh, content for Show Us Your Cat. And I think from the earlier episodes of Show Us Your Cat, due to your involvement and sending us some pictures of boats that you would never think would ever float again for a start, showing people that it is possible to take a boat that looks in such a sad state and restoring it so that it can be used a lot um, has really helped so many people. So if you're restoring a boat, then definitely um, as soon as you start the process, before you even take it out of the bush, um, take some pictures because um, it really does make for a great story. Yeah, nice. All right, Mason says, uh, Hobie 16 and a lot, not a lot of wind and in not a lot of wind. Okay, so first one on the Hobie 16, not a lot of wind for upwind performance. Uh, let's just look at the boat setup for starters, um, what we want is to have as much power coming out of the rig as possible. I'm gonna draw a picture, um, if that's all right. Hope you're enjoying this new um, studio setup. Um, this is why I did have a slightly accidental live stream earlier on uh, today. But I thought it'd be nice to try some new angles. Again, I could still do with sorting my lights out a bit better um, to get rid of this big old shadow. But okay, so first thing in light winds with the with the 16 or anything similar is we want to get as much rig tension on as possible. Um, by getting more rig tension on. What this means is we're bringing the mast a bit further forwards. What that's going to do is present more sail area to the wind. Um, also, it's gonna stop the mast, if this is the mast without rig tension on, looking from in front or behind, and if this is the mast with rig tension on, um, so by putting more rig tension on, the mast is going to stay more upright, which means, again, we're going to be keeping more power on, which is going to really help for the upwind sailing. Um, the next thing that we are getting from bringing more rig tension on is we are increasing this distance here, which means that it is going to be possible to get more tension into the leech of the sail. Again, that's gonna help 
to keep uh, more power on. But with, um, so if we firstly talk about our main sheet tension uh, when uh, the wind is lighter, the people who are able to sail the boats the fastest are the ones who can keep as much tension as possible in the leech of the sail by having a load of uh, main sheet on, but without stalling it. Stalling the mainsail is when you have it in too tight. Um, because if the mainsail is too tight, then if we look from above, um, yeah, okay, wind's coming this way then. If, the, if, a, if it's too tight in, then the wind is gonna start becoming turbulent as it gets to here. Um, this is like, if exaggerating slightly, if the boat is kind of like this. So this would actually be called having the mainsail hooked. Um, so it's gonna become turbulent there. And on the leeward side, we're gonna lose any airflow down here. So it's like the back part of the sail, this whole part of the sail is gonna become useless if we've got the mainsail in too tight. But not only that, but we can kind of see that the wind is actually gonna be causing us a load of drag if we're oversheated. So in lighter winds, especially, um, when you're not trapezing, you really need to keep an eye on those telltales on the mainsail and they will let you know exactly how much main sheet to bring in. So if the inside telltale is lifting, then that means we can sheet in more. But if the outside telltale is at any time not flying straight back, we do need to let the main sheet out to make sure it's not oversheated. Now, the same thing goes for the jib, but with the jib, it is slightly different because um, we are going to steer the boat um, according to the angle of the jib. So if we just get a boat in here. And then here's the jib. So before we start steering the boat to the jib, um, we don't want to have the jib in as tight as it will go because if we really crank it in hard in the lighter winds, what that's going to do is it's going to change the shape of the jib from that more to that. So it's going to be very flat, which means we're not going to be getting much power or drive from the jib. So it's better if you sheet in as hard as you can and then just ease off an inch or two, probably an inch is enough, then that's going to put the shape into the sail. And then we're going to sail the boat by looking at the telltales. So um, if the red is on the side that we can see through the sail, again, at all times, that should be flying straight backwards. So if at any time, that telltale on the outside of the jib isn't flying straight backwards. We want to turn up very slowly and very smoothly towards the wind um, because if the outside telltale isn't flying straight back, it means we're not close enough to the wind. And then if the telltale on the inside, if it's very light wind, we want to have it flying straight back. So if there's only just enough wind to have the boat moving forwards, then let's have that bad boy going straight back. If the wind has increased, so occasionally um, you can just feel the windward hull lifting slightly, and this is the same for all types of boat, um, then we can allow the inside telltale to lift. So we're sailing closer to the wind. And then um, if we're able to actually lift the hull out of the water, we could have it lifted even higher. But the main thing is outside telltale always wants to be um, straight back. Okay, um, then light winds, any type of boat, same thing. With your steering, 
and with any movement of the people on the boat, keep it all as as um, discreet as possible. Any big movements with the rudders, that is going to disturb the flow of water around the rudders, slowing you down. Any movement of people on the boat, if you feel the boat move, that means we have failed and we have slowed our boat down. So any movement of people on the boat needs to be very, very subtle. Because um, if you do feel the boat move at all, we are going to be slowed down. So then um, the last one is crew positions. We want to be pretty far forwards on the upwind. So um, um, the, the helmsman, the steerman, the person driving the boat up towards the front beam and then the crew um, if it if it's very light level with the helm but on the other side um, if it's getting windier then just up um, around the mast now with the forwards and backwards movement on the boat um, you can't just say all right so it's six knots of wind this is where we sit um there might be different things at play you might be sailing with a different crew so what you want to be looking at um with your boat with the platform of your boat is that with your on the upwind again this is any type of boat with your forwards and backwards movement that wants to line up with the horizon so it really wants to be as flat as possible because on the upwind, to prevent leeway and to get lift, we want to have an even amount of hull and rudder in the water. If we put our, because it's very tempting to trim the boat too far forwards, but then if we do that, we're going to lose rudder in the water, which on a boat like a 16 is really critical um, as part of our leeway prevention and to give us that sweet lift on the upwind point of sail. Um, I hope that helps there, Mason. Um, yeah, if there's any other anything else, uh, please stick it in the live chat. All right. So back to the live chat. Cheers. By the way, just a quick note, if you are thinking of doing any Christmas shopping, yeah, um, from TotalJoyRider.com, get yourself a nice shirt like this one, or there are so many other styles on there, and I can do custom designs as well. So if you want your sale number on whatever it is, or a picture of your boat, anything at all, um, it can be done. Um, but the deadline for anything to arrive for Christmas, just been announced by um, the printer that I use, is the 5th of December. There you go. Get in there quick. But it's a very easy um, way to do your Christmas shopping. I'm um, just about to load the store with some more stuff as well. Um, but have a look. There we are. Thank you. All right, we've got channel member Jens on board. Hello, Jens. Nice to see you. Um, great to have you on board. We've got BJVDB with us. Our main on our NACRA 6.0 seems to get harder and harder to hoist. There seems to be a lot of resistance the last couple of metres. Is there a way or a trick to reduce the friction. Yeah, um, first, or all of the tricks to reduce friction on um, uh, hoisting your mainsail. First one is just without the sail attached, take the two ends of your main halyard and just kind of pull them like that and see if there is any resistance in the halyard without even having the mainsail attached. Because what it could be, if it's gradually been getting harder over time, it could be that the small wheel at the top of the mast, the sheave, 
has become worn. Uh, what usually happens with these sheaves is they get worn in the middle um, rather than um, the outside. So the hole in the middle gets bigger, which means they can actually jam, which means your main halyard, rather than running over a pulley, is just kind of dragging over something that doesn't move. So check that first. Check your halyard. And if you do feel resistance, incidentally, this is the same for if you've got resistance with your spinnaker as well. Check the halyard. Just by doing this, grab both ends, give it a pull. Nice. Um, second thing you want to make sure is make sure that the sail and the mast are dead in line. So that, that's going to mean having um, your boat sat head to wind. If it's a little bit off head to wind, then what you can do is you, because we've got uh, a rotating mast, you can rotate the mast so that it sits in line with the sail. But the best thing to do is make sure the boat is perfectly head to wind and the mast is in line with the sail. That's going to make things a lot easier. Then the big one which can really help um, if you've done those two things is get your sail wet. Um, so I demonstrate this in a video, actually, but um, in several videos. But if you've got the ac access to some fresh water, whether um, you've got a hose pipe nearby or what you could do if you were going to be uh, quite organised is get like one of those um, sprayer bottles that you might use in the garden. Um, then uh, just get take one of those filled with water every time you go sailing and just use it to spray the front edge of your of your sail, the bolt rope. Um, uh, so you get it wet before you hoist it. And I prefer to use water than any other sort of lubricant on the sail, uh, mostly because water is fairly cheap. Um, but um, compared to like uh, whatever the Harken lubricant is called or even silicon, um, but water is going to do a good job. And if you put too much on, you're just going to run the risk of washing your sail rather than having a horrible slippery mess, uh, which you could get with a spray. Uh, that's why I like water. So get it wet, into the wind, check your sheaves are good, and that should make the biggest difference to hoisting the sail. If um, when you pull the sail up, if you do find there's a lot of curve in your battens as it goes up, then one thing you can do is just make sure that all of your battens are popped on the same side. Because um, if you've got a batten curving that way and a batten curving that way, that's going to create more resistance when you pull the sail up. There you go. I hope, well, I'm sure that that should help um, to reduce the friction. If you haven't got water available, um, there should be some water that you're going to sail in. and Although it's not great for your boat over time, but at the time of hoisting your sail, um, I did try it just dipping the, the front edge of the mainsail in the sea to get it wet to hoist it makes it a lot easier. But of course, you will want to wash your sail afterwards to get that salt water off. OK, so we've got Toot on board in Texas. Um, just sent you a show us your cat video and photos. Hope that you like it. Oh, yes, I'm looking forward to seeing that, Toot. Great stuff. Toot follows on and says, um, if anybody can spare the time to hit the like button, that would be very helpful indeed. Thank you very much. All right. So um, Ryan uh, in Maui says, recommend a custom, oh, here we go, a custom designed honey cat Light, lightweight sweatshirt for everyone. It's getting a bit chilly right now. Yes, there we go. So uh, yeah, I did Ryan a whole um, spring collection featuring the colours of his sale uh, from the Total Joyrider store. Very nice indeed. 
All right, um, Ryan continues. Uh, he's just saying to Etan, I'd love to connect about the 5.2 rebuild because uh, Ryan happens to have one there as well in Maui. Um, so nice to connect on that. Very good. That's what we're here to do, to bring people together. All right, um, we've got Duke on board. Hello, Duke. Great to have you with us. Duke says, what should I do about mast rotation? Hmm. Yeah, if you've got adjustable mast rotation on your boat, it's time to draw some pictures. All right, switching to camera two. This is a brand new uh, studio. Uh, so let's have let's start off with a boat. So your standard position for the mast rotation, if you've got a mast rotation control, of course, on a lot of boats, you don't have any control over it. Um, and the way that we determine which, how we describe the mast rotation is which direction this bar is pointing in. Uh, the bar just um, kind of emphasizes which way the mast is pointing. Um, it, incidentally, if you didn't know, it's called the spanner bar. Yeah. So the general position, um, and if you were going to leave it in one position all of the time, this would be the position to leave it in. If that's our shroud, so that it's pointing at the shroud. Um, the way that the mast rotation works, incidentally, if you didn't know, is if this is our boom, like you generally only have a mast rotation control on a boat that has a boom, uh, generally speaking. Um, there'd be a line coming from the spanner bar which goes to a cleat on the boom. This is the most common system. There are, of course, other systems. And this line restricts the mast from rotating any further. So this is our standard position. And we'd keep the mast in that position if we're sailing and in conditions where we're not really having to depower. So. If, um, yeah, if we're double trapezing and we're quite happy that we don't have too much power, we'll just sit with the mast in that position all of the time. It's once we've got to a situation where we've been sailing and it's got windy enough, so we've put the downhaul on absolutely full, um, that is on the upwind, that is when we want to bring the mast rotation in and what we'll do, I'll draw it in another colour so we can see the difference, is we're going to bring the mast rotation in so that it then points towards the back beam, like this. So this is basically our range with the mast rotation for upwind. So from the shroud to the back beam. Um, the reason why we're going to bring it in more when it's windy and we're wanting to lose power is because if we look at the shape of our the whole rig, the, the mast and the sail, if we've got the mast round and then here's the sail, we're going to have this shape here. That shape is going to give us a lot of power. So if we're not overpowered, we want that. But then if it's windy, if we've got the downhaul on full, yes, the sail is going to be flat, but we're still going to have this curved created by the mast there. So when we bring the mast more in line with our flat sail, the whole rig becomes flat. Then on the downwind point of sail, um, if you've been sailing with the mast pulled on on the upwind, we can then um, let the mast off on the downwind. Let's go for another colour, if we can here. 
and we're going to let it all the way off. So if you completely release the mast rotation control, it will turn to about 90 degrees. So it'll be pointing straight down the beam. And we definitely want to do that um, if we're using a spinnaker. If we're not using a spinnaker, then it's not essential to do that. But if you have been sailing with the mast rotation pulled all the way into the corner, then yes, you should do that. Because otherwise on the downwind, your mast is going to be bending the wrong way. There you go, Duke. I hope that helps. So that is if you've got a mast rotation control. If you haven't got a mast rotation control, then you don't have to worry about it. Congratulations. There we go. All right, so Philip is on board in sunny Ireland. Nice to hear that. Um, it has been a rough old bit of weather of late, so good to hear that you have seen the sun again. All right. All right, we've got Declan on board in Sweden. Nice to have you with us, Declan. Um, just in at the end. All right, so I think we have made it to the end of this new look Q and A. Um, before you go, let me know what you thought of the new look where we can switch to camera two. Yeah, Declan says, love the multi-camera angle. And, um, you know, we've also got yes, this right. available yeah, yeah, where I could, right TV, um, for upcoming episodes God, of the Q&A, I can flip to some video God. footage. So and if you are going to preload a question, one, what I can do is, um, oh, your pardon. is um, yeah, so in future episodes, what I can do is if you have got a preloaded question and it's appropriate, I can actually record a video, um, short video with a boat if necessary of um, what I'm actually talking about and be able to show you that in an upcoming episode of the Q&A. That's exciting. All right. So just before we um, tune out... We've got David on board in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, he was featured in Show Us Your Cat, episode 47. Always learning something new. Sadly, the snow is already starting to fly. So the Hobie 16 is going into storage for the winter. Too bad. All right, we've got very fast tornado sailor, Jan Leo, in the live chat. He wanted to share. He's ripped his, um, his Zeke or Zeke wetsuit. 80% depth on a pitch pole. Fixed it with Black Witch neoprene cement and the Zyke Smash Repair Kit. Seems very solid. Yeah, I've heard good things about the Black Witch. It's like um, it's like a type of glue, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah look after your wetsuit because uh, that's keeping you warm. Um, thanks for that, Jan Leo. All right, so... Uh, Declan says live calls in the roadmap in the future. Yeah, I'm just uh, one step with the technology at a time. Um, but yes. All right. So um, I think that's about the size of it. So thanks very much for tuning in. Something I forgot even to mention something very exciting. I wonder if I can actually treat you to a little preview here. Um, um, can I? Maybe I can. If if everyone's bearing with me here with this new setup. New boat arrived this week. Oh yeah, and we had some wind. All right. Um, I think that's all we can afford for now. But um, yes, I had a new boat, picked it up, built it, sailed it, and yes, it was epic. So should be having a new video on Sunday um, featuring that bad boy. So there we go. All right, nice one. I'll see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. Thank you very much.